eldership. They go out searching for a man to come work with them. And then somehow that evolves into the eldership saying, we have a man who works for us. Is there a difference in those two statements? We want a man to come work with us. So you go out and you search for a man. We understand the biblical precedent of preaching. The fact that a man is right, he is well within his biblical right to be hired to preach, to provide spiritual things, and in the process he receives what? Material compensation for having done so. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So now why is it that we get a man there, we know that this is what we need, how shall they hear except we have a what? Preacher. We understand the biblical concept of that work, but somehow in the process of things it goes from a man working with us to now he works for us. Now I'm going to honestly tell you, I've never experienced this. I've, I've never worked with an eldership. Matter of fact, I've only worked with one eldership. One. For 25 years, I've worked with one eldership. Now, how many of you can say that? As preachers. They're the finest men on the face of the earth, in my opinion. I've worked with them for a quarter of a century. I've never in my life felt like, in my preaching life, that I was their servant in the sense of they've hired me. I'm your employee. Even though I am employed by whom? The Fruitvale Church of Christ. So this is a fine line for us to be navigating. And I have the greatest respect for elders. I cannot imagine the constant weight and pressure upon an eldership. We have 140 members at Fruitvale, roughly. We have 40 of those, I would estimate. My daughter might give us a better number of that, but I'm talking about children who are not accountable yet. So we have 100 adults who are accountable to God. And that weight is upon four elders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you want to understand the severity of an eldership, just go and seriously contemplate Hebrews 13, 17. They are men who must watch They are men who are accountable and they have souls under their charge. I have the greatest respect for elders. I also have the greatest respect for preachers. I am one. The charge we have is to preach the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. I can remember that being just somewhat pounded into my head as I was at preaching school. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Now what? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when what? Men will heap to themselves teachers because they want their ears to be tickled. But I think in 25 years of preaching that the most important aspect of preaching, which is 2 Timothy 4.2, couple that though with 2 2 Peter 3. We have to remind brethren to do the things you already know to do. Sometimes that involves reminding an eldership. And then sometimes that means we as preachers take a look in the mirror and we have to remind ourselves of what I'm to do. And preachers, we're not elders. 
Now, a preacher can be an elder, but I'm not one. And personally, and I've expressed this to the elders at Fruitvale, as long as I'm preaching, I don't want to be an elder. I don't have that desire to be an elder while I'm preaching. Because I want there to be that distinction between the eldership and whom? The preacher. And when one becomes a preacher, in my opinion, and an elder at the same time, then if, a, if something has to be said or done regarding the preacher, then how difficult does that make that? And I know there's some in here that may be elders and preachers at the same time, but you have to really discipline yourself to walk that fine line, or else that can turn into a diatrophies situation. What diatrophies want? Preeminence. I'm the man. I'm the church boss. Well, you have a man that stands up in front of the audience, every, the congregation, I should say, every single time a sermon is delivered. Plus, he goes into an elders' meeting in an elders' room, and now he has the accolades of the congregation. He goes into an elders' meeting, and he has that floor as well. It takes a special man to navigate that line and be the preacher that he ought to be and to be the elder that he ought to be. For me, when I retire from preaching, if I'm qualified to serve as an elder, then I'll take that task on. Preaching is a work. Remember when Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist? When you go to 1 Timothy 3.1, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Same word. Same word found for a preacher, same word found for the elder. What does that mean? We have a job to do, we have a task to do. And so this morning as we address these thoughts of why is it that seemingly some preachers and elders can't get along with one another... I want to know you to know from the outset, I respect with the utmost ability and power that I have the work of elders. Elders and preachers are my heroes. Why are they? Why are elders my hero? Because they are men of holiness. And without holiness, we cannot see whom? God. They're my heroes because they're men who are holy. Now the church is to be holy. But elders take on that responsibility and they are guiding and they are moving and they are directing themselves and the congregation toward holiness. They're men who are eternally minded. They're constantly thinking about eternity. And not only are they thinking about it for themselves, but they're thinking about it in regards to how are we going to get brother so-and-so mature enough to display holiness so that he might enter into eternity? How? in good stead. What a responsibility. What a responsibility to volunteer, to sign up for that work and to say, I want to mold and to help shape people's lives so that they can go from an unholy state to a holy state. We can prepare them for eternity, and I'm going to shoulder that responsibility. And they are observant. Good shepherds are observant. John gave the analogy last hour of the shepherd that they observed on their latest Bible land trip and how that that shepherd was constantly observing what? The flock. the flock. 
When I look at the job of preaching, my job as a preacher is made easy because I have four godly shepherds. Sunday morning rolls around, I step up into the pulpit, I open up the Bible, and I can preach anything I want as long as it's a thus saith the Lord. People have asked me over and over and over again in the 25 years of preaching, Carl, why, how have you stayed there 25 years? I've not had a reason to leave. I stand in the pulpit, want to preach on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, shell the corn. You want to preach on the oneness of the church? Let it happen. You want to preach about the torments of hell and the glory of heaven? Preach on it. Whatever subject it is, homosexuality, just preach the Word of God. Who wouldn't want that as a preacher? To have that climate where the only way you're going to get in trouble with my eldership is if you don't preach the Bible. I've not had a reason to leave. Have I had opportunities to leave in 25 years? Yeah. I've had opportunities. But I've never had a reason. And I think sometimes preachers, they, uh, they get the opportunity confused with the reason. The only way I'm leaving Fruitvale is when they dra- drag my dead carcass out of the building. That's when I'm leaving. Or if something happens within the eldership and the climate changes so that now I have to leave. But they're going to have to drag me out of there. And they'll roll me up through those aisles and they'll put me out in that hearse and they'll drive me down the road and they'll bury my dead body in the dirt. And then the preaching job at Fruitvale will be available. That's my plan anyway. Now one of my elders is here. He may have other plans, so y'all may want to visit with him. But that's my plan. So when we think about elders and preachers, I want to first of all, after reiterating my admiration for preachers and elders, whenever there's difficulties between preachers and elders, there's oftentimes that's a two-way street. The two way street. Preachers begin to think more of themselves than they ought to. Oftentimes, elderships may underestimate and take for granted their preacher. There's, there's always a two way street on this. But there's only ever been one perfect preacher, and who was he? There's only ever been one perfect shepherd, and who was he? Jesus. There's only been one man that's been perfect in his entire life. So when we deal with elders and preachers, we realize we're not perfect. And when human beings have to deal with imperfections, then there has to be patience, understanding, forgiveness, even between preachers and elders. But I believe there are some things that we can do that will help us in this regard. And I want us to notice some principles. John brought some of this up, and we're going to deal with this really this morning um, in four ways. We're going to look at preliminaries, we're going to look at principles, we're going to look at practical aspects, and then lastly, and I've asked Brother Dole Bruce to give me the at 10 minutes till our deadline time, because I want some participation. Like I said, I've, I've never dealt with this. I've never dealt with this feeling of, well, I'm just the church's employee. Or I'm the elder's employee. I've never dealt with that. Uh, I'm not saying that um, in the years that I've been there that there haven't been the discussions that take place between elders and preachers. And sometimes we may not be we may not be in 100% sync when we start out. But what do you do? You discuss and you work through things and then you come out on the other side and, all right, we're good. 
Because elders are the ones that ultimately make decisions. Elders don't make doctrine. Elders make what? Decisions. I may not initially agree with every one of their decisions. But I'm not going to run home and start talking about all their decisions and how I disagree. Or I'm going to run to one of the deacons and, oh, can you believe what the elders decided? I may not agree with all their decisions. But guess what? I don't have to. Do I? Do I have to agree with every decision that the elders make? Do they have to run them by the preacher to make sure this is the right one? I submit to their leadership. They make the decisions, not me. Can I help in that regard? Certainly. If they want my help. How many preachers think you need to be in every elders meeting? What meetings do I attend with the elders present? The ones they ask me to. If they don't ask me, what do I do? I go home and I hug my wife. And I thank God for those men who are staying at the building, who are discussing matters. And then whatever decision is made, if they feel that I need to know that, then I'm told. Preachers, sometimes we need to learn our place. I'm not, I'm not an elder. When you look at Philippians 1, verse 1, Paul addresses the church and he says, to all the saints who are with the bishops and the deacons. I don't have a footnote in mine that says preachers. If I'm not an elder and I'm not a deacon, then what must I be? I'm a saint. The elders don't feel the obligation to invite all the saints to the elders' meetings. Do they? Now they come out and they make a decision. They inform the congregation. Now, to say that does not mean that the preacher cannot be included and at times he ought not, that he shouldn't be included or they should. But that's not a thing that I expect to be invited to the preacher's meeting or the elders' meeting. And so... We think about the church. I think this is one of the contexts that will help us. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, we have those absolute ones. But what precedes that in Ephesians 4? I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, we will walk worthy of the Lord. How? Notice in verse 2, he says, With all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. That word bearing, what does it mean? It's the idea of supporting, encouraging one another. So you notice now, to the church, he says, there's a way that we are to walk, and that's in accordance with our calling. There's a way that we are to conduct ourselves, and that is with lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, supporting one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, then we immediately jump to the the seven ones, but that endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit is just as vital in the relationship and the conduct and the attitude that's found in verses 1 through 3 as verses 4 through 6. How are we to conduct ourselves, elders, with lowliness, which means what? Humility. Meekness. Gentleness. Some translations place it. With long-suffering. What does long-suffering imply? But what does it what does it imply? Be patient, not difficult. 
Difficulty. There's somebody or some group that's difficult to deal with. Does it not? There's somebody or some group or some problem, there's something that's causing difficulty. And just because difficult times arrive does not mean I get to somehow at that point jettison what? Humility and gentleness and meekness. No, it's in the midst of those times of difficulty where lowliness and gentleness and meekness are to be displayed. And it's there that we're showing we're doing what? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a cause greater than any eldership or any preacher. And what is that? What is that cause? The church. The church is greater than any eldership or any one man. And we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You drop down to verse 11. And He gave some. I think that's an interesting thought. Why are you an elder? Why are you a preacher? Have you ever stopped to think, as we talk about the eternal purpose of the church, it being in God's mind and His eternal purpose, that God was looking down through the corridor of time, And every time I step in the pulpit, I try to remind myself that in eternity, God saw Carl McCann standing in a pulpit. Now what does he require? When an eldership makes a decision, whatever the eldership is, and our four men that we have at Fruitvale, In eternity, as God looked down upon through the ages of time and He come to the 2015 year of the work of the Fruitvale Church of Christ, He saw our four men. He gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be preachers. He gave some to be teachers. He gave some to be evangelists. He gave some. So whenever I step into the pulpit, I'm there and I'm God's preacher. When elders go into the elders' meetings and they're making decisions and they're shepherding the flock and they're feeding the flock and they're making sure that things are right with the flock, then we see where elders are there And God saw them long ago. Do we believe that about God? But do we ever lose sight of that? You know, we get so caught up in church business that we lose sight of the fact that God sees Toby step into the pulpit. He sees Tyler step into the pulpit. He sees Richard. He sees us step into the pulpit. He knows. And somehow we lose sight of that fact. And when we do, I think we we set ourselves up for a downfall. We set ourselves up for failure. We think about problems. We think about principles. Is there a person in here that can't quote Matthew 7, 12? The golden rule? All of us in here could quote that. If uh, you know, We may not get it exactly right, but we, could, we understand the gist of Matthew 7, 12. What's it mean? Treat others how you want to be treated. So why is it that elders and preachers can't Remember that when they come to discuss matters. You know, I figured out yesterday, I don't know how I'm still at Fruitvale because I did everything all wrong when I took that first job. There's not a single thing on paper. Not a single thing. I don't have days off. I don't have weeks of vacation. I don't have a limit on gospel meetings. I don't have a limit on... Lectureships, I don't, I don't have a single thing on paper. No 
You know what I was told when they hired me? You take care of us, we'll take care of you. Now, Don, don't go running back and say, hey, we've got we to get a contract for this guy. But I, I, I figured out I, I've done this all wrong. No. For me, I haven't. Because the elders, you take care of us, we'll take care of you. I've got enough common sense to know when I'm gone too much. I'm not, I'm not the preacher that's looking to be on every lectureship or to hold a dozen gospel meetings a year. I have a congregation in Fruitvale, Texas that I love. That's where my focus is. Now, if I get to go to a gospel meeting, if I get to go to a lectureship, well, that's good. But I am not going to abuse the privilege of standing in the pulpit at the Fruitvale Church of Christ. I'm not. And preachers lose sight of that. My work is not to cover the brotherhood and speak everywhere that I could possibly speak. That's not my job. My job is to stand before the congregation at the Fruitvale Church of Christ and to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus and get that group of people, as much as my role will allow, get them fit for what? Eternity. Preachers, we lose sight of that. And when we lose sight of that, then we go into the elders' meeting and we say, oh, I, I want to hold six gospel meetings this year. And the eldership say, well, well, maybe we need to cut that back to four. What happens? Well, I'm just your employee. You just, you're just shackling me. No, they're not. They're doing what? They're looking after the flock that's what? Under their charge. So, okay, instead of holding six gospel meetings this year, I'm just going to hold four. Guess what? I still get to preach at the Fruitvale Church of Christ. I'm not shackled from preaching, but we get to thinking more of ourselves than we ought to, and so now suddenly we see the, the, the elders are closing in on us. Well, in that instance, I still want to be treated the way I need to treat others the way I want to be treated. What about passages such as Genesis 13 and verse 8 in this elder preacher relationship? Um, You remember Abraham and Lot, their herdsmen began to strive with one another because they had great possessions. Great things were happening. God had blessed them abundantly. Now every preacher and every elder here has God not blessed us abundantly. I have blessings untold. And yet, what did Abraham and Lot, what did they decide? We we can't be fighting over this. We can't be striving over this. Why? We're brothers. When we come into elders and preacher relationships, we need to remember we are what? Brothers. And there is a blessed tie that brings us together. And that's the fact that we're brethren. And we ought not to be striving over these things that are, in so many ways, petty things compared to the large overriding picture. We think about passages such as 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. How can you claim to love God whom you have not seen when you hate your brother whom you have seen? You know, we, we just somehow feel that it's, it's alright for us to be hateful and mean and spiteful to one another. 
And which it's not. We think about other principles. The fact that Romans 14, 15, and I know the context is different, but Paul is addressing the church at Rome and he says, are you going to destroy the one for whom Jesus died? That, that, that concept needs to even be understood by elders and preachers. As an elder, yes, I preach for the Fruitvale Church of Christ, but as the eldership, Jesus died for me and Jesus died for them. And am I going to destroy one whom Jesus died for? You see, we just lose sight of biblical principles because we get so caught up in what's going on at the moment. Now, very quickly, practical points. We've set forth the preliminaries. I love elders. I love preachers. I have no congregation in mind. I have no eldership in mind. I have no preacher in mind. Do these problems exist? They must. And where they do exist, they're what? Horrible. They're horrible. Because we are not endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That has been destroyed. We're now biting and devouring one another as Paul brings up in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. Now you need to be careful lest you bite and devour one another because the danger is you be consumed. We lose sight of what we are to be doing and that is saving the souls of men. So from a practical standpoint, what will help us in this regard? Communication. Thank you, Doyle. Communication. Uh, honestly, men, we just don't communicate as well as we think we do. And if you don't believe that, go out this door and ask your wife. That's just, we just don't. And some of this is with the elders. They go into a meeting and they discuss things and they may discuss things for months on an issue. And then they come out of that meeting and they come to the congregation and they make an announcement. And that's the last that's said or heard about it. You think everyone in that audience got that announcement? I can assure you at Fruitvale they didn't. Because there's some mama somewhere that's having to take care of a little one and she didn't catch that announcement. Her child has just dumped everything that she's brought on the floor and she's trying to gather it up and the elders are up there and they're making that announcement and so she's down here focusing on this and she raises up. It's said and done. But in the eldership's mind, what do they think? Oh, we've communicated that to the congregation. No, you haven't. Not to all of them. We need to make sure that we're communicating. And elders and preachers need to make sure that they are communicating. Hebrews chapter 13, 16, uh, the Hebrew writer talks about communication. I understand that in the context there, it's talking about fellowship. That's the word, the word koinonia. That's the word that he's using. But f- fellowship and koinonia means partnership, sharing. Elders and preachers need to make sure that we are, to the degree that it needs to be done, partnering and sharing to carry on the work of the congregation. There are times when the elders need to convey and the preacher needs to know the what, the where, the why, and the when of certain activities. They need to. Now there are some areas that preachers don't need to know about and common sense will give us direction in that area. But we need to know the what, the where, the why, the when. What are we going to do? What are we not going to do? Why are we going to do it? Why are we not going to do it? When are we going to do it? When are we going to stop it? The preacher needs to know that so that he can help the elders to facilitate that decision and so that everybody is on the same page. That leads us to a second point. There's got to be some coordination. We have got to blend and to work together so that these things can be carried out. God is not the author of what? 
confusion. But sometimes the greatest area of confusion is between what an eldership is planning to do and how the preacher can help them to facilitate carrying out that work. So there has to be some coordination, some blending together, making sure that the elders and the preacher are on the same page. Now, point number three, we have communication, we have coordination, and then there needs to be great care that is taken. We think about care and we think about some other words, compassion. Understand, elders, that your preacher is not perfect. And preacher, you need to understand that the eldership is not perfect. There are going to be shortcomings. There are going to be downfalls. There are going to be times when you're going to... You're not going to be in 100% agreement. But we need to make sure that we continue to show compassion and that we remain courteous to one another. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Courteous, courteousness. You know, courtesy is something that is vastly and very quickly eroding. Every morning at 6.30, I start a bus route for Fruitvale ISD. Now, if you thought preaching was crazy, driving a school bus is certifiable. But I drive a school bus, and every morning when the kids step on, I speak to them, every single one of them. How are you doing? Good morning. Did you have a good night's rest? How many of you think respond back? 10%. I wish. I wish it was 10%. We are raising a generation of kids that don't even have the common courtesy to say good morning. Well, we can become calloused in that area as well. We cannot express concern. My struggle, my weakness, is compliments. I don't take them well, and I don't give them well. Some people are great complimenters. Some people, you know, they are just, they make you feel so good by the things they genuinely say about you. I struggle. I struggle with that. If I walk up to a preacher and I say, hey, that was, a, that was a great sermon. If you knew the struggle that it took for me to say that. Or if I go up to the eldership at Fruitvale and I tell them I love them and I think they're doing a good job for me personally, that, that's pushing me out of my comfort zone. That's a weakness that I need to what? Work on. Because we have to be complementary to one another, genuinely. But those are just areas wherein I struggle. And so when we think about the fact that we need to be complementary, then we realize, and Franklin Camp made this comment in a book, it says, life has a way of giving back to us what we give. That's an area of weakness for me. I struggle with compliments, giving and receiving. But elders need to know that by, from their preacher, we thank you and you're doing a great job. But elders, you also need to do what? You need to tell that preacher you're doing a great job. So we need to have an understanding that elders have crosses to bear. Every Christian has a cross to bear, but elders have extra They're not only bearing their cross, but oftentimes they're carrying the crosses of whom? The entire congregation. So, we've looked at preliminaries, we've looked at principles that we need to keep in mind as we deal with elders and preachers. We've looked at some principles and we looked at some practical things, but now I don't know how much time I've got remaining, but I want to throw this open to participation because, gentlemen, I don't consider myself an expert in any way, and any insight you have to share, I welcome it. I will say in my few years of serving as an elder that <clears throat> elders don't always agree either. 
No. But when a decision is made, the decision is made, and, and, and the elder maybe who disagrees doesn't go out and tell the congregation, well, I really didn't want that. As an ownership, you, you decide this is what's going to be done, and, and, and that's what it is. And you, 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 you buy by it. That's it. And that's the way even with the preacher. I think the preacher falls into that same line. I may not agree with that decision if the eldership sees fit to include me in letting me know that that decision was made. Well, I may not agree, but I am not going out into the congregation and undermining an eldership. That was my other point of the make. Richard, should not get up there and say whatever decision is made, it's made. Right. And to go against what the elders... Elders, do they always make a, the right decision? Maybe not. But it's a decision based on what they see within the congregation and what they think is best for the congregation. And have... Can they retract it? What they do? Certainly they can. Mm-hmm. But have you ever held an opinion that you didn't think was right? I mean, my opinion, I, I hold that opinion because I want. I think it's right. Well, like I said at the outset, elders do not make doctrine. There is no other doctrine. Elders make what? Decisions based on the teachings and the principles found in Scripture. But... My opinion as to how or what or why we ought to do a certain thing is my opinion. I hold that opinion because I think it to be right. But my opinion may not be the opinion of the eldership. But when they make a decision, then as everybody comes to me and talks to me, and how many of you have had that happen? Well, guess whose opinion I'm now presenting? It's not, I'm presenting the eldership's opinion. Or if not, I'm telling them, you don't need to be speaking to me about this. You need to go talk to the elders. That's the best way to handle it. Instead of saying, well, you know, and I, well, I, I, don't, I know they made that decision. I don't really agree with it, but we have to support the eldership. What have I just done by that wording? And I have just undermined their authority. The best thing for me to say is, well, that's their decision. We support them. And if you have a problem with it, you need to go see them. Talk to them about that issue. It's, why is it that we say we don't have a, a denominational pastor system? But we do. We do. Why is it that when people are struggling, the first person they want to come to is the, the preacher? Now, that's not that we're immune to helping people or that we shouldn't be able uh, want to, but the fact is, who's responsible for their souls? So when people come to me, and I'm not going to turn anybody away, but why is it that people want to run to the preacher? Why don't they say, I've got to go speak to the elders about this? Elders don't know their sheep. Yes, sir. I think, and I don't want to oversimplify it in this thing, but, you know, as you, you mentioned, you know, I think the problems of elders and uh, preachers is the same problems of deacons and teachers and other members. You know, we have a tendency, we don't know, we don't know Scripture as well as, as we should, or we don't, we, don't, we don't submit ourselves to it as we should. And, you know, we have a tendency to, to look at ourselves higher than we should or look at others higher than we should. And, you know, you look at the qualifications for an elder, you know, and you have, obviously, it must be a husband, a husband of one wife, you must desire the office, you must have children. Those are obviously qualifications that don't necessarily affect uh, a man's Christianity, spirituality, but looking for the Apostle Paul or Christ for that. But all the other qualifications are qualifications that are listed throughout Scripture for all things. Exactly. You know, an elder is not someone who is superior. He's simply someone who has demonstrated having lived a faithful Christian life. Right. But people look as an elder a lot of times and they want to put them on a pedestal. That's the denominational view that you're talking about. And the same thing happens with the preacher because he's out there, he's in front of them, and we want to elevate that. I think it's two two things. One, we're elevating them, and two, we're also excusing ourselves. Right. Of things that we should be doing. And so we need to understand how, how it all works together. God didn't put a hierarchy down here. We've all got jobs to do. Right. 
And I think the Ephesians 4 context, when you continue looking at that, as John brought up even earlier, there is the that which every joint of the body supplies. And we work together. I need all the help I can get to go to heaven, don't you? I need the elders. I need every member of the congregation. And then in turn, I need to be as much help to everyone as I can be so that they can what? Go to heaven. That's the whole... You know, if we, I don't want to put this in any kind of improper uh, vernacular, but that's the end game. Going to heaven. That's the end. As Peter would say, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That's what we're here for. And God has given us this very unique yet simple plan. You have elders who shepherd the local congregation. We have deacons who serve under them. We have a preacher whose job is to proclaim the unreachable searches of Christ and to be a servant to all. And that is a marvelous, marvelous organization. John? Carl, one of the things I failed to really mention last time talking about here. I, I wonder if as an eldership we make it or our eldership make it hard for people to come to them because about the only time that they may get to see the entire eldership or meet with them is in this cold, sterile conference room with a huge desk and it's almost like you're going to the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. And if elders were out more approachable going to the homes of people and Black setting, sitting down, we're just Christians here, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a shepherd talking to you. Um, I just wonder if we would have a whole lot more impact if we went out there alone. Mm-hmm. Richard? You know, simplify, I guess, is, is Philippians 2 3. You know, that, the idea that we are to elevate one another, mm-hmm. we are to place one another up on a higher, higher plane. Because he says, do all things with loneliness, but esteeming one another mm-hmm. better than yourself. Mm-hmm. And if, if I keep that mindset, whether I'm talking, you know, uh, to the eldership, to the you know, then I'm elevating you up. What, uh, when, I, when I find a person that, uh, that I esteem better than myself, I'm going to treat them with the respect and the honor and the dignity, and, and I'm going to treat them in that certain manner. And so I think that helps our relationships so, so much better if we would do that. Right. You know, we try to, I mean, sometimes we try to blame, uh, as preachers, we blame the elders because they don't uh, handle a situation fast enough. Well, we might not know the whole of it. Right. You know, we don't know all that. Or we may blame the elders and say, well, the congregation doesn't approach the elders because the elders don't spend as much time. But this is a, a, something that we do with one another. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, the eldership given charge over the flock. But just as Jesus uses that illustration, he said that they know one another. And that's a two-way street. Yeah. And if you, got, if you want a hireling, John 10, if you want a preacher who's just a hireling, then what can you expect from a hireling? Yeah. He's not, he's not invested. He's just there for what? When paycheck runs out or things get difficult, then what's the hireling going to do? He's out the door. All right, brother, your hands up. Look, I'm just going to say, we, we keep, got to keep in mind that there's to be no divisions among us. Well, here at the University of Christ, we've got five of us, and, and no one of us needs to be guilty of making the decision without the other. Exactly. And sometimes a brother will come to us, and I found the best thing to do is just listen and hear them out. And not try to really make a decision right then. You know, try to guide them and say, well, why, why don't you, you know, if you got off with your brother, you need to do what the scripture says and go back over and tell him. And then if it's not satisfied, come back to us and let's, let's visit with all of the elders and let us see if we can work this out with y'all, or what, you know, whatever. But we've got to be unified and, and, when we leave a meeting uh, here, we're, we're always in and that, agreement. Yeah. And that's the way that it needs to be done. We have a united front. You know, we always told my wife and I with our children, we always said, now, we may disagree behind the doors, but when we come out, our children see what? A united front. Mama and Daddy are on the same page. Okay, now, when y'all leave here, 
And Sam says, what kept y'all so long? I mean, uh, when Wayne says, what kept y'all so long? Then y'all just say, uh, we wouldn't let the preacher go. Okay? Thank y'all so much. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, appreciate all your comments. Speech on. Accessories and scenes you select. Living room. Living room. Music rec. Selected. Screen recording. Button.